The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. I'd like to now introduce our next um, presenter. He's going to present on condition assessment and concrete repair strategies at water treatment structures. Stephen Foster is an associate with Weiss Janney Ulster Associates. Okay, so like Kim said, I'm Stephen Foster. I'm an associate engineer in, uh, with WJE in our Austin office. And I want to do a quick case study for a condition assessment we did for a trickling filter uh, at a water treatment facility in Arizona. We'll give us some background over the structure and, and kind of what our goals were for the task. Um, really going to spend most of our time today talking about the various assessment strategies we use to perform our assessment, um, talk about those results, how we use those results uh, to develop a service life model, and then quickly go through uh, our repairs that we use as well. So our task was a comprehensive condition assessment of the concrete structure. This is a view of the inside of the trickling filter uh, after the trickling filter media had been removed. So uh, typically the, the trickle filter looks like this. The, the water comes in through that uh, standpipe in the middle and is distributed through this rotary equipment where the, the filter media, then uh, the water trickles down, hence the name trickles down across that, that media. Um, what you see here are, are the, the beams that support that filter media. They're spaced at two feet on center. Um, so the entire substructure is concrete. We'll, get, we'll see more of that in a minute. But our goal, this, this uh, trickle filter had been in service since 1986. So it was already in service for 25 years. And they had had uh, signs of previous distress for about the last 10 years. So our goal uh, was to develop uh, a, a service life for an additional 30 years. And we knew we were going um, similar to what Larry talked about, going directly into construction documents. We also provided a report, but we also knew our assessment uh, was going to be used to develop construction documents for repair. Um, typical beams are 220 beams, spaced two feet on center, uh, one foot deep, eight inches wide. The, kind of the unique thing they have are these uh, two and a quarter inch tall, uh, we call them ears, that support the filter media and allow the water to not collect on top of the beams. Um, Typical girder, 18 inches square, uh, 16 feet long. Uh, there are 106 of those. Uh, the piers that supported those girders were 14 inches in diameter. They ranged in height between three and three and a half feet. Um, they had done previous repairs to one of the adjacent trickling filters. So at, at this water treatment facility, there are six trickling filters. Uh, we were involved during the construction observation portion of the repairs for one of the adjacent trickling filters. So we had some idea of what type of distressed to anticipate. So one of the things that they repaired on the previous trickling filter was uh, they had some longitudinal cracking along these ears uh, just from differential shrinkage of that of that smaller ear during construction. Um, they also had some cracking of the slab. This is during repair doing some uh, gravity feed epoxy. They also had some of the beams missing the hairpin reinforcement at the ends uh, near the expansion joints. You see the photo on the left shows the reinforcement that was supposed to be in place as designed and then the photo on the right, those hairpins are missing and only have the vertical dowel. And also because of that, there was uh, quite a few beams that had spalling at the ends of those, uh, at the end of that bearing condition. And the sealant joint around the interior of the wall was also in pretty bad shape, uh, and that was also replaced. So again, our, our goal was really to develop a wholesale understanding of the structure. Uh, and we want to be able to, obviously, like Larry said, anyone can go out there and see, oh, there's a crack or there's a delamination, and we're going to fix those things, obviously. But also we want to know uh, for the long term, to get another 30 years service life out of this, 
uh, what can we what can we do to focus our maintenance strategies? Which areas are critical? Which elements are critical? Uh, and again, also we wanted to make uh, make sure we had good precision in our repair documents. And the real question is, you know, what do we repair now versus what is the the client going to have to repair in the future? So um, we know we have a source of chlorides. The, the the influent water in that trickling filter has roughly 200 milligram, milligrams per liter of chloride. So uh, not a whole lot, but it's a moderate source and over time certainly enough for them to accumulate and, and cause corrosion. So the question is, where are we on this plot? Uh, certain areas we'll see already had surface damage. Other areas may have already had corrosion propagating. The question is, uh, where are we and when are they going to have to repair it and what can we do uh, now versus later? So the main tools we have are separated into two categories. We've got Field investigation uh, tools, we also have laboratory evaluation tools. And the key you want to do is work with those together uh, in concert to try and create an overall assessment that you're going to be comfortable uh, knowing what you got uh, and what your, what your current situation of the concrete is. So uh, field investigation strategies, we did a visual survey, we did acoustic camera sounding, uh, we also did a cover survey, half cell potential, uh, corrosion rate testing, we'll get into all of this. So, uh, we did a 100% visual survey. Uh, every top bottom side of every beam, every girder, every pier, the perimeter wall, and also the slab. Um, the key, obviously, you want to identify any visual or audible delaminations. Uh, we also documented any crack patterns uh, for any cracks greater than 10 mils. Um, we also did our non-destructive cover survey. The key there is you always want to uh, you calibrate your equipment first of all, but also verify that with your with your destructive opening. So where we uh, made our connection for our half cells, you know, we would verify uh, if we did a non-destructive cover survey there and it said two inches. Well, when we drill that hole for half cell, do we indeed have two inches? And we can make sure that our non-destructive measurements are indeed giving us the correct values. Uh, and based on that visual assessment, then we can. Uh, that's when you now can lay out. Okay, where do we want to do our half cell testing? Where do we want to do our corrosion rate testing? Um, so you use that, the results of that visual survey to help identify where do we want to locate these additional uh, testing, testing measures that we'll talk about. We also saw some paste erosion along the soil line. You can see here uh, where your typical soil line was um, around the perimeter of the tank. So because of that, we added, you know, we, we felt that was likely salt hydration stress, physical sulfate attack along the exterior of the tank. And so we added uh, to, our, to our list of laboratory evaluations, we wanted to test uh, the concrete and the soil both for sulfates, and we'll see that in a minute. So half cell potential ASTM C876. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time to get into exactly how this works, but hopefully you've done it before. Uh, you've got a, a voltmeter or multimeter. You tap an electrical connection to your reinforcement and you run the other lead wire to a, a stable electrode, a copper, copper sulfate electrode that has a, a stable potential. And you're measuring the potential difference using the concrete as your electrolyte. And, and basically, if you have ongoing corrosion, that process is going to give you a, a, a negative number. And ASTM C876 tells you anything more negative than uh, negative 350 millivolts gives you a 90% chance that you have a probability of corrosion ongoing in that, uh, at that particular location. Now, one of the many factors that will influence that is, is whether or not the con concrete is saturated. The more saturated the concrete is, the more negative your potentials are going to be because that uh, concrete is now saturated, that, that those ions can flow a lot faster and, and, and create a, a more negative reading. Uh, and for us, what that, what that really meant was the, the structure had been out, out of service probably for about six months from when the filter media was taken out and exposed to the environment. So the, the concrete was progressively drying out from top to bottom. You remember that photo with the beams exposed to the sun and open to the atmosphere. It was progressively going from, from dry to, to more saturated. So from the beams to the girders to the piers to the slab, we had this typical gradient where if you see on the, on the left, we went from uh, less negative at the top to more negative at the bottom, which it uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have a higher probability for corrosion at the bottom. It just meant uh, it's more saturated at the bottom and, and things were drying out kind of from the top down. So what that meant, uh, we were looking for hot spots, um, anything that didn't follow that trend. Um, so like this photo on the right is from two different piers. Uh, you can see that this area isn't exactly following that trend and that may be a potential area where you have ongoing corrosion. Same thing with the beams and the girders. So again, a uniform gradient 
probably not much going on, but if you've got a spot where you've got a hot spot, again, these values uh, aren't necessarily in line with the ASTM, but that's because the concrete was so dry uh, at that point at the tops of the girders and the beams uh, that these localized hot spots were really cluing us into, hey, this may be an area where we want to do one of our, our core locations or do some additional investigation. We did corrosion rate testing as well. Uh, we, we did that at, at the same areas where we did our half cell potential to try and uh, align those two values. Uh, again, not a whole lot of time to get into it, but basically you're measuring uh, the polarization resistance using a similar, uh, similar setup where you make a connection to the reinforcement and you're testing that. Uh, really, you're, you're translating that into your corrosion rate. So it's an instantaneous snapshot only of uh, what is the rate of corrosion going on at this location, uh, if there is any. Um, you can see the values there on the left for this piece of equipment as far as your ranges. And we had, we had low values uh, for the beams and, and, and moderate to low values for the, uh, for the girders and the walls. We weren't able to do anything for the piers due to the, the geometry, the cylindrical shape. We couldn't mount that device uh, and get a good reading on, those, on the round piers. We also tested for carbonation. So carbonation essentially lowers the pH in concrete, which will uh, destroy the protective passive film on the reinforcement. Um, we use a phenothaline solution, which turns pink for, pink for a pH greater than 9. So what you're looking for there is anything that's not pink, you know your concrete is carbonated and you've got an increased risk uh, for corrosion. That, that passive layer will deteriorate sometime between 9.5, a pH of 9.5 and, and 11. So um, if you're not pink, you know you're well below that. Uh, and so one, one thing I want to notice here was we've got uh, a crack at this core. Uh, you can see the carbonation penetrates deeper at a crack, and you'll see that that's also true for the chloride. So uh, you may get a typical carbonation depth, but if you've got cracking, uh, you know you've got probably uh, deeper carbonation at those locations as well. Um, it typically progresses around one millimeter per year. Again, we were 25 years old. So for, for typical concrete, typical exposure conditions, you would expect to have about an inch of, of carbonation, which is what we had on the exterior of the tank, uh, slightly less than that. Our average was about three quarters of an inch, but uh, you can see here on this core, we were right around that one inch. But on the interior of the tank, um, not near that high, again, because um, moisture and relative humidity will, will impact your carbonation progress. Uh, when, well, obviously, when the pores are saturated, the, the carbon dioxide can't uh, transport as fast. So you can kind of see here, the beams kind of get the direct uh, water uh, saturation. So we went from kind of uh, the least amount of carbonation depth of the beams and then progressing uh, higher down towards the, uh, to the piers. But again, all less than our, what I would say, a typical concrete uh, progress. So uh, carbonation depth uh, weren't too, wasn't too deep uh, on the interior of the tank. We also did GPR uh, because of the hairpin issues on the adjacent trickling filter. We wanted to verify whether or not that those hairpins were in place. Uh, so we did both horizontal and vertical scans at the ends of these beams. We did roughly 40% of the beams, which was uh, probably more than anything generated by how many we could get to in a particular day. So um, all, all scans showed that all the hairpins were in place. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened there. Maybe the contractor. Uh, we realized he didn't do it right, and on the next time around, he put them in and didn't tell anybody about the first one, I guess. So um, GPR revealed that we didn't have any issues like we had on the first uh, trick moon filter. So for laboratory evaluations, um, we really want to get a, a view both of the, the concrete itself, the inherent properties for that concrete, but also any external uh, issues that may be going on. Really for us, uh, it was, again, the chloride uh, uh, attack, chloride uh, concentration in the water and also we had some uh, concerns about maybe sulfates along the soil line. Uh, so we did petrography and compressive strength again just to get a general uh, idea of the composition of the concrete and to identify any potential internal distress mechanisms. We didn't, we didn't anticipate any and we, we verified that there was no ongoing ASR or DEF or anything like that. Uh, we had a couple of localized air voids in some course but uh, nothing, that, nothing that would trigger us to believe that this concrete uh, wouldn't be durable and wouldn't be able to maintain and, and, and handle another additional 30 years of service life. Our compressive strength uh, was well above the design strength. We were up near 6,700 6, psi and our design strength was 5,000. So 
not, nothing from petrography or compressor strength that would make us think this concrete uh, was, was at risk for, for not lasting another 30 years. We also did RCP testing, which uh, measures uh, the ability for concrete to resist chloride penetration. Um, and, and again, this is kind of a background uh, general characteristic trait of our, of our concrete. And we were getting all uh, very low permeabilities, ASTM C1202. Uh, gives you the, the range and the values and, and kind of can describe the test method there you see on the right. Uh, but again, we had nothing really above a thousand coulombs, which was giving us a low, uh, a low permeability. Like I said, we tested for sulfates, both in the concrete and the soil. Uh, concrete showed us we had about 1.4% by mass uh, of sulfate uh, between a depth of zero and one inch. So just at, at the surface, we had the sulfate concentration in the concrete, and we also showed we had uh, basically a moderate sulfate exposure in the soil. So uh, what we did here is we took a core samples from below the soil line, at the soil line, and then above the soil line to kind of give us a feel for uh, what was going on. And typically what happens or what happened here was uh, moisture in the soil gets absorbed by the, by the concrete, and then as that moisture uh, evaporates above the soil line, all, all the sulfates are deposited uh, there. So directly above the soil line is where the, the attack was going on. Okay, so the big, the big laboratory analysis that, that really helped uh, us understand the condition of the, the structure, but also help um, develop our service life model is chloride content. Uh, and there's two ASTMs for this, one acid soluble and one water soluble. And the key that we want to know is what is our chloride content at the depth of reinforcement. And the, the corrosion threshold is roughly 350 parts per million by weight of concrete. Uh, and it's at what point your corrosion uh, of the reinforcement will start to occur. Now there are some chlorides bound uh, internal to the concrete, uh, both either chemically or physically, that aren't able to promote corrosion of the reinforcement. So what we want to do is run the difference between those two, acid soluble and water soluble. The top two lines, the top two solid lines, show our acid soluble. The bottom two solid lines show our water soluble results. These are just for two particular, uh, particular cores. And the dashed line is the difference. So the difference between the two will kind of establish our background chloride content that's not available to promote corrosion. And our average uh, for our structure was 70 parts per million. So that means now our, our particular chloride threshold, uh, if we're looking at acid soluble, is now going to be 420 parts per million uh, rather than 350 parts per million. So that's what we're looking at for um, if we're going to get uh, anticipate corrosion going on at the level of reinforcement. Uh, you can also see that uh, it's typical, or typical here for us to have a, a peak or a hump in the chloride content around a half inch to an inch, and that was primarily due to the transport means of the chlorides. At, at the surface, we more or less have um, the chloride content of the water itself. So the transport mechanism is directly by water flow. As those chloride ions are absorbed into the concrete, uh, you get a large deposit near the surface, again, a half inch to an inch, and then the, the rest of the chlorides are, are pro pro progressed through the concrete by means of diffusion um, as that concentration uh, dies down throughout the depth of the core. So, so for us, uh, the, piers, the piers showed the highest amount of chlorides, and we also had the least amount of cover. These vertical lines, dash lines, show our average cover for each element and then our, our average chloride concentration. So uh, we were above our threshold at the level of reinforcement uh, for the piers, and we were below our threshold for both the, the girders and the beams. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the, the wall on here, but the top of the wall uh, had extremely high chlorides. Our, our average near the uh, depth of reinforcement was between 500 and 800, which really meant our peak was up near 1,000 parts per million. And that was because, uh, similar to the sulfates, uh, the chlorides are absorbed, uh, and then as, the, as it evaporates at the top of the wall, as the water evaporates near the top of the wall, the chlorides get deposited in higher concentrations there. Uh, so the top of the wall was also a concern. So, so quickly, the results kind of for each element. Similar to the other trickling filter we had cracking along the beam ears, some of those beams ears had spalled off. Uh, we had some transverse cracking on top of the, the girder supports just from restrained, uh, restrained movement. 
we took those cores at some of those hot spots and we didn't have any ongoing corrosion and again our chloride content showed that we were below our threshold at the level of reinforcement um, and again you see our cover and carbonation depth were good there so uh, other than the discrete locations of cracks or, or uh, the, the condition of the years no real issues with the beams uh, the girders we had no visible distress uh, on the sides or the bottom however on the top we had some transverse cracks between those beams so we're spaced two feet on center and those uh, two foot uh, openings basically we had some transverse cracking that looked like plastic shrinkage cracking um, and basically at 20 percent of those we had those those areas and if you remember that half cell potential where we had a hot spot on the top of the beam uh, similar to carbonation chlorides will do the same thing so for this particular core where we have a crack uh, you can see our, our peak is all the way near up as deep as two inches um, where our chloride ions are, are progressing. Again, that's because we have a crack that's allowing those, those chlorides to penetrate deeper. So um, half cell potential showed roughly the same thing. Of our locations, we had about 35%. So between the 20 and 35% of the tops of the beams uh, were exposed to a greater risk of chlorides and, and probably had some ongoing corrosion. We also had some discrete uh, delaminations at, at the center standpipe where these beams uh, uh, mount onto that standpipe. It's not really a girder, but it's a, generally the same idea. It's, it's these, uh, due to restrained thermal movement, we had some delaminations there. The piers, we had, we had corrosion again. Our, our chloride content was, was high at these piers. We had the lowest amount of cover, only about 1.2 inches. Uh, and we had ongoing uh, corrosion at the cores we took at the piers. Um, interesting note here is we have what was called black rust as opposed to red rust and the real difference there is, is it, that type of rust due to the, the lack of oxygen and the saturated concrete it doesn't expand as much so we could have uh, more ongoing corrosion uh, with less visible surface distress because the, the corrosion product doesn't expand as much as your typical rust so we may not have delaminations or cracking even uh, even though we have ongoing corrosion the top of the wall again we had high chlorides at the top of the wall we also had about 30 to 40 percent of the top of the wall was either delaminated or you can see here once we laid our hammer to it we completely spalled off uh, and we also had the, the sealant joiner like the bottom uh, similar to the adjacent trickling filter was was in bad shape the slab we won't cover this very much but we had some local delaminations not near as much cracking as we saw in the adjacent trickling filter and uh, the core showed good cover depth and, and no ongoing uh, corrosion and again our chlorides were, were low so, so the service life model taking what we learned from our uh, both our laboratory evaluation and our and our field investigation studies the question is where are we at uh, on this on this model how long do we have until we have surface damage uh, at, at the piers or at the other locations um, and we don't have a whole lot of time to get into the, the specifics of how you create a service life model, but basically we take our, our field data and our chloride contents and we calibrate our propagation time. So how long will it take from when corrosion in initiates to when we'll have surface damage? And again, uh, say for the piers, we know we've got typically a little bit longer time because we know we've got black rust instead of red rust. So our, our calibrated time uh, based on everything you would input into this model is 22 years. So 22 years from when uh, uh, corrosion begins to when you'll have surface damage on the surface of the pier and based on that uh, we were we our service life model you use uh, fixed sec second law of diffusion and there is pretty complicated and I don't have time to get into it unfortunately but uh, you basically use our exposure conditions we know what type of concrete quality we have you also look into your cover depth and your, your uh, visible cracking the more data you can get the better the more chloride uh, information you can gather the better your model will be uh, and we were anticipating somewhere between seven and ten years we would have ten percent of the piers uh, have visible surface damage which was our threshold um, the, the client here again is a water treatment facility so if they have any sort of spalling concrete or or anything getting into their water and into their pumps and pipes it's going to be an expensive fix and an expensive uh, shutdown of the plant so 10 percent was our threshold um, so in five to seven years we were going to have or five, seven to ten years we'd have 10 percent of the peers excuse me uh, have that 10 percent uh, threshold which really meant uh, in that same amount of time we'd have about 50 or 60 percent of them with ongoing corrosion uh, to give you an example, the, the beams and girders, this slope uh, would have been a lot more shallow and we had 25 to 30 years of additional service life for the beams and girders. 
So again, our goal now is 30 additional years of service life. Obviously, we're going to pick up all those visible service damage uh, and the items we went through, but we want to be able to focus now, because we've done our service life and we've taken good laboratory studies, we feel comfortable that the peers are kind of our, our weak link, so to say, and where we need to focus our, our long-term maintenance strategy for, for the client. And also, again, the top of the wall. We've got high chlorides there. It was already, again, between 30 and 50 percent delaminated. Um, so that's where we want to focus our two long-term maintenance strategies. Uh, real quick, some of the localized areas, we can, we can gravity feed epoxy into those cracks along the beam ears. And other locations, we also uh, had to rebuild the ears that were, that were completely spalled off. Uh, we did a partial depth repair at that soil line around the whole perimeter of the tank. We also put a, uh, a coating over that to prevent future uh, sulfate attack. The tops of the girders, uh, where we had that, again, 20 to 30 percent of, of cracking, we removed the concrete, chloride contaminated concrete, put in some discrete galvanic anodes, and also provided a coating over the top of that to prevent future chloride ingress. Uh, we also repaired the beam ends and, and the, the standpipe at, at the center of the tank. So for the, for the piers, we decided to go with a stay in place sacrificial cathodic protection jacket. This, this jacket has a fiberglass shell with a zinc mesh. You can see the zinc mesh is embedded uh, into, that, into that jacket. Uh, we repaired uh, those cracks or visible corrosion. We would, this particular pier doesn't have it, but uh, this was one where we didn't have really any visible distress. But other ones, we would also do our partial depth repair of those corroded reinforcement um, and augment that as required and then uh, also use our, our embedded zinc mesh to provide future galvanic protection for the reinforcement. We also had an alternate where we could use a coating system for this, but the coating system um, wouldn't really provide any additional uh, protection, any uh, galvanic protection for the reinforcement. It would only limit the, the chloride and, and oxy available oxygen uh, in the future. So we felt the cathodic protection jacket would be the, the best uh, system to go with the 30-year service life. And again, at the top of the wall, so we repaired the entire top of the wall uh, we installed galvanic anodes there and again provided a coating system uh, across the top of the wall, really uh, both the inside top and all the way down to the soil line. We coated that wall uh, to prevent uh, future attack. So in, in summary, our advantages for a, a comprehensive condition evaluation, because like Larry was talking about, sometimes you, you, you're not always wanting to do this, but the advantages are you really get a wholesale understanding of the structure. You can, you're able to focus your long-term maintenance strategies and understand wh what is the, the weak link, so to say, and where do we need to focus our repairs uh, in addition to just you know, picking up all the delaminations that are visible. What, what's going to be the problem in the future? What has the shortest views? What makes sense to repair now versus repairing later? Um, and, and also creates a precision in our repair documents. The 100% visual survey, uh, we were up about 10% difference from our final construction documents. Uh, which in concrete repair sometimes it can be as high as 50% uh, when you don't, you don't quite know what you're getting into and, and the contractor gets out there and your scope just keeps growing and growing and growing. So, um, yeah, any questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You know, service life prediction, I assume you suppose that the water source would remain the same. The Correct. Do you have data on your water to see about where is it coming from? Yeah, so we, we have done a lot of work at this, at this particular facility, so we had tested the water on, on other projects before, and so we know uh, the, the source is, it's in Arizona, just outside of Phoenix, so they're taking all the wastewater from, from the city of Phoenix and the surrounding area, so we had, we had tested that water to know what type of chloride concentration we have, and that's certainly our, uh, yeah, and assuming that that's going to stay the same. What coating season do you use? Ooh, good question. We used we used two types of uh, of coating system. We used one that went from the interior of the tank wall and, and then wrapped around the top. That was that detail you see here, where it kind of terminates. This is this would be the the interior of the tank and terminates at the top. And then we used a, a different coating system for the uh, outside of the wall, something with a little bit more UV protection for the outside of the wall. And then also used a different uh, coating at the soil line where the sulfate attack was. Kind of membrane? Yeah, protective membrane, yep. Yeah, go ahead. About how long did the entire system take? What percent did it cost of that relative? <laughs> the, the assessment took, we, we went out there in two different trips. So we did um, was it two separate one-week trips, I believe it was. 
Um, so we had a team of first trip, I think we had three or four guys, and then the next trip we had three guys. Uh, did, some of that probably wasn't required. We all, in addition to the trickling filter we did, uh, there's some adjacent vaults and, and some other things that inside the trickling filter. We also had kind of the collection channel and some other things I didn't get into today. But roughly it took two full weeks with a team of, of three or four guys. We had another guy kind of bouncing between two projects. But um, two full weeks of three guys working 10 hours just a day really to do 100%. One, the first trip, all we did was the beams. So we had uh, 220 beams um, to get top, bottom sides, and, and also everything Larry talked about with confined space and, and uh, you know, everything you need to do to be aware of not falling through the beams. I mean, we kind of had, uh, took a while for sure. Okay.